Hello, everyone. It is Jamie Jill Wright here with Madlet Musings, and I have a returning guest with us today. We have Kim Vogel Sawyer. How's it going, Kim? It's going okay. It's so good to have you with us again. Oh, it's great to be here. Thanks so much. <laughs> I've got the giggles a little bit because we were cracking jokes before we hit record. So I'm going to try to collect myself. <laughs> Oh, fun. Well, you have a book that's coming out this spring. That's right. And it is titled The Songbird of Hope Hill. And so that's what we're here to talk about today. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm going to ask you that question that all authors just absolutely treasure and cherish. <laughs> What's your book about? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, this one's going to be a little different than what I've actually done in okay. the past. I think readers, I mean, it's still my voice. It's still a story of hope. But I've never sent a book in Texas, oh. so that's unique. And um, it's a story about um, prostitutes. I mean, there's no easy way to say that. Um, it's a, a minister and his wife whose mission is to um, rescue and rehabilitate these mm -hmm. fallen women and give them a, a fresh start in life. You know, the whole redemption process right. and so um i'm excited about it i think it's a great theme yeah. and i really enjoyed exploring it and mm -hmm. taking those characters to yeah. the, those places but um <laughs> they uh readers might be a little surprised when they first start reading <laughs> where we start out in a brothel <laughs> well, so they we'll were see. We'll see. They were a very, and they, they still are, actually, if we're honest, uh, sadly, part of yeah, it's, the world that we live in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. it, it's been there since biblical times, so it's not, you know, it's not anything new by any no. stretch of the imagination. No, it's not. It's always kind of interesting to me, too, and I'll be interested as we chat today to hear your take on it, Um, how, like, you're like, well, oh, readers might be kind of surprised, but it's not like, it's not like even prostitution back in the day was glamorized or glorified like sometimes it is on tv in fact so many of the women from my understanding of history didn't go into prostitution willingly in the sense mm -hmm. it was like it was trafficking um right for so many of them i mean not necessarily every story but tell me mm -hmm. what what kind of stuff did you find out as you were researching well a lot of it was just desperation these were homeless girls, they were orphaned girls, they were girls that had nowhere to turn. Mm -hmm. And someone says, come live here. I'll give you food. I will shelter you. You'll be protected from the storms. And then once you give yourself in that way, you wonder, will anyone else want me? And so you stay out of desperation. And it really is a sad situation for so many of them. It's heartbreaking. Um, and then, of course, the way society often looked at these fallen women, um, soil, I mean, just the, the word that they use, the soil doves. Yeah. Um, how how do you ever get past that on your own? If, you, if you're a soil dove, they, they trap themselves mm -hmm. in that, those brothels because they were too fearful to come out and face society. Yeah, yeah. It, and, you know, unfortunately, too, the society they were afraid to face was so often based in the church. Yes. Exactly. In, that, in that biblical hierarchy of righteousness where you've yeah. not achieved this level that somehow makes you worthy to come before God, which mm -hmm. is strange. That's not the story yeah. of grace. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> As yeah, Jamie said, we are just so terribly human. <laughs> oh. Yeah. <laughs> so what made you what took you in this direction for story tell me a little bit about how you dreamt it up and and why you were willing to take the risk to go into well, this. it actually rolled in the back of my heart for probably six or seven years um one of my dearest writing friends Eileen Key lived in San Antonio and she passed away oh goodness it's been about three and a half years now I sure miss her mm. but she was always she wasn't a historical writer she liked to write okay contemporary but she was always looking for story fodder and she came upon an article about a reverend jt upchurch um who lived near waco 
Okay. And in 1894, he actually established the Baraka Rescue Society, which was to redeem and aid prostitutes and other fallen women. Ah. Um, women that found themselves, you know, pregnant out of wedlock. Sometimes uh -huh. they needed a place to go to. So mm -hmm. he opened up a place where they could come, they could live, his wife, and he educated them, they taught them skills. The other thing they did was um, they did revival meetings. They would travel and do revival meetings. And they formed these, these fallen women, these prostitutes into a choir that sang at the revival meetings. And I just thought that was the coolest thing. Um, I loved the whole idea of the redemption uh -huh. and the, the singing God's praise. When you're a person who has fallen, what could, what would that do to your heart to right. be a part of a group that sings God's praise? Yeah. And so I, I, I really wanted to write a story about it. It took a little while, you know, to get it contracted because again, it's a little different than what I've done before, yeah. but I love that it really was based on something that, that did happen historically. Um, they were in, in the story that, you know, they have a hard time finding a place to settle. And that was true of Reverend Upchurch as well. His, his wife and he were run out of town because wow. people were not happy with what they were doing. And so oil doves into yeah, town. Exactly. Oh. So, yeah, I mean, there was just a whole lot that I could do with that. And then yeah. I threw a little, you got to throw a romantic thread in there. I mean, that's just part of the story. And so I gave Reverend Upchurch and his wife a son named Ephraim, who played a traveling organ. Have you ever seen a funeral organ? They used to carry, they had, they're real small. They're about the size of a small desk and they're, they're a pump organ. Okay. But it's small enough that it could be carried from place to place. And we have one at the Inman Museum, okay. Um, okay. which is close by here. And I, when okay. I spotted that, it's like, oh, there's Ephraim's organ. So. <laughs> <laughs> he he plays at funerals also okay. um but yes that's this he's is well-rounded he's well-rounded well, revivals and funerals that's yes. perfect <laughs> <laughs> well you save them and then you grave them <laughs> i can't believe i just said that uh, yeah, anyway. i have so much respect for you now it's just skyrocketed <laughs> <laughs> so you know that he was completely this um fictional you know yeah. they're I don't know if the uh, churches had children, sure. but um, I threw Ephraim in there. And of course, then that becomes a love interest. Yeah. Yeah. For, birdie, for my little birdie, mm -hmm. which is Aww. the songbird of hope. <laughs> oh, so cool. I love it. I love it. You know, it's interesting because you think about, you know, some people could say, oh, of course you're going to have a romantic element with the woman coming out of the brothel and they kind of like, you know, go in that, that frame of mind. But I love the picture of that because it shows that life continues after, mm -hmm. after mistakes or after right. I mean, either way, whether it's choices you've made or choices that were made for you against you. Exactly. Um, yeah. I mean, they suffer the consequences for the things that we choose to do, but we also suffer the consequences for the things that are done to us. We have yes. control over what not over the other. Right. And I think we really need to work hard on compassion. Oh, yes. Because we don't know what somebody has battled. We no. never know what anyone has worked through. No. And we just need to err on the side of compassion mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in all circumstances. Oh, there's a yeah. preaching to it. <laughs> but preach away. I think it's great because I do think it's, you know, it's one of those things where there's a fine line between drawing, you know, people will be like, well, there, there needs to be standards. I agree. And I think scripture has laid out standards very, very clearly in, in a lot of situations. Um, but along with those standards, scripture has also laid out the concept of forgiveness, of mm -hmm. compassion. And that doesn't yeah. necessarily mean I forgive you that you're in the sex trade therefore continue happily. Right. You know, it, you know, it's not necessarily, that's not what we're saying. What we're saying is forgiveness and love and compassion comes from um, understanding that really we're in the same position when we stand before God. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. All have sinned and fallen short. Uh -huh. We might sin in different ways, but we've right. all fallen short. Right. Right. So when you attacked this attack, that's such a strong word. Jamie, she doesn't write killing books. 
<laughs> but when you when you um approach there's a better word when you approach the subject of of prostitution through history um and birdie being your main character now did she did she choose the lifestyle or was she trafficked into the lifestyle or did she just kind of like stumble into it or what's a little bit of her story well her story is um her father passed away she had never been close to her mother she didn't understand why that will come you know, readers will understand that as the story mm -hmm. goes on um and then her mother ran off with another man and left Birdie alone. Okay. And she was too young to really get a full-time job and was, but she remembered her mother had this friend okay. in high school. And so she went to, knocked on the door, just, I need something to eat. I'm hungry and I need something to eat and was invited in. And what she had to do to pay for her, her okay. keep. Yeah. Um, yeah. Then became selling herself. Yeah. yeah. Right. And that was really common in that era. Mm -hmm. And fortunately it was. Yeah. yeah. Especially in the West, in the Western mm -hmm. society where yeah. as women, unlike today, you can't just walk into a place and, and, and jobs were short and few and far between. So it was literally life or death. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Which is interesting then because my, my perspective, when you look at it from those, uh, those, eyes my perspective on the concept of prostitution even shifts a little bit because i think there's a maybe it's a, a handed down image of prostitution being someone who goes into it because they're they're the jezebel or they're mm -hmm. the you know the scarlet ribbon that wants to do this right. i'm sure there were some of those probably seen in the madams and things like that mm -hmm. um, but so many of them it was just sheer survival sheer survival and then for some of them, because of the way they were treated as children, certain things that, again, those things that happened to us, right, right. there are some that think this is all I'm good for. Mm. And to me, that's the most heartbreaking, that they yeah. don't see themselves as anything other than a person to be used yeah. by others. That, that just makes me want to weep. Yeah. And that's too real. So right. many of the runaways, um, the children, they end up in prostitution. Mm -hmm. they come from backgrounds of molestation and abuse yeah and they just don't know anything yeah. else yeah. and how sad how sad is that oh. yeah it's extremely sad and you know I know you're a mother and I'm a mother and there's probably lots of people that are listening are mothers grandmothers etc and you look at your children and you're like the concept of not valuing them as your most precious yeah. gifts yeah. um and then raising them to believe that they're worth nothing more than being used like a dollar bill. Yes. It's just, that's just horrific. It's hard, to, it's hard to comprehend, truly. It is. It is. Much yeah, more I know it's than we even realize. Yeah. 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 Then and now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. So when Birdie goes to escape or leave the life, um, that she was in does she go through because uh, I've heard that it wasn't easy to get out of not just because you couldn't make your own living but because at mm -hmm. that point you were in a sense you belonged to the John or the madam type of a situation right. so did you write that into the book um I did <clears throat> Reverend Upchurch literally truly would okay. visit the pro the brothels okay and invite the women he would tell them we have we, we can offer you a better life come mm -hmm. out come with us we'll show you a better way it was a really hard way to to get the, the women to come um and often he was not met well <laughs> <laughs> by the, the madam or the johns you know they That's wanted hard. to keep making their money they wanted to keep having their fun i mean that sounds terrible but the selfishness behind yeah. keeping the history yeah um, but it's you know, a birdie made the brave choice mm -hmm. to walk away, to come mm -hmm. with him, to, to take that chance. And um, it was not met well by her, madam, either. And there are some consequences that follow that, mm -hmm. uh, which will come out in the story. But I I was so proud of her <laughs> for making that choice. Right. <laughs> so that yeah. was the first step, you know, stepping away. Uh -huh. But there's so much healing that has to take place. Yeah. Uh, it it really, it, it was joyful for me to take Birdie through that journey towards 
believing that she's worth something um, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. the relationship that she had with her mother kind of made her feel that she wasn't worth much. Yeah. But yeah. fortunately, she'd had a loving relationship with her dad before he passed away. And so that helped her understand that there was a loving heavenly father. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, <clears throat> we are so important as parents because really we are. that example, you know, if we're not loving, if we're not forgiving, if we're not nurturing, how in the world can a child ever believe that there is a loving, caring, nurturing God? Yeah. Loves them. You know, yeah. mm -hmm. we set the example. So yeah. there's yeah. a little bit of that in there as well. <laughs> yeah. And I'm going to guess that the Reverend and his wife, um, since they have a, a son, are probably the example of the parallel to or the juxtaposition to what Bertie grew up under. Yes. Yeah. With that healthy setting, parent. Setting a, a different example for all of the girls yeah. that are there. Yeah. The other thing that I really enjoyed working into this story, um, there's a little girl who lives with the, the, the family. I don't call them the up churches in the family. <laughs> um, they're the overlies. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Change the last there. name. Yep. Yes. We have Isaiah and Ophelia overly. But there's a little girl living with them who um, was the daughter of a prostitute. And shortly after she was born, the, the, the mother left and didn't mm -hmm. come back. Mm -hmm. and but left this little girl and she is an elective mute mm -hmm. and I've never used a character with elective mutism before yeah. but it just worked with this story mm -hmm. um, because I had one character her voice is what draws Ephraim to her it's this beautiful singing voice that she mm -hmm. possesses and then another little one that, that cannot make a sound or choose mm. not to make a sound at all. Right. So, you know, that was kind of fun uh -huh. to work and do the story. I had a, I, in my years of teaching, I had one little girl in my class mm. that was an elective mute uh -huh. and um, took almost all the way through the school year before she finally whispered something in my oh. ear in response. And I just felt like she had given me the crown jewels. Oh, exactly. That yeah. point, yeah. She trusted yeah. me enough. Right. To do that. But, right. Yeah. yeah. So that's anyway. awesome. No, I love that. I love that. And I love the, the diversity of characters within within a story like that too. It just brings a lot of richness and depth to um a, a story that's already dealing with with things that we have to struggle through. Mm -hmm. So so then you do the revivals. Or do you actually have revivals in the book and kind of go into I do. I do. And let me tell you. Reverend Oberly is quite the preacher. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow he did. doesn't strike me he as did. the hellfire and brimstone preacher, but maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but you know who he's aiming it at is the ones that are the, the holier than thou. Oh. The ones that stick their noses in the air and think that no one else, you know, deserves salvation except mm -hmm. them. And so, yeah, it's it, maybe a little bit of preaching in there, but. <laughs> I mean, the the scenes are brief. That just right. oh, sense. Yeah. 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 But it's there's just some things that need to be said. <laughs> there are, there are, and revival meetings were great places for them back. Oh, the absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. The other thing that was really fun is looking at what were the common hymns during that time. Oh yeah, and because you know things have changed with what we sing today, mm -hmm. and. So 1894, 1905, you know, that area, there were a lot of hymns that we sung when I was in the, in the 1960s that really weren't common yet, you know, I at that time. True. I wouldn't have thought so, of that. Yeah. So yeah, it was fun to see what was actually in the hymn books at this time. What are the words that I can use here? And there's so much richness in yes. hymns. Mm -hmm. I mean, the doctrine is so sound and the language is so beautiful. Mm -hmm. I really had fun choosing my hymns that the girls could sing at That's the revivals and working some of those words in to minister to the congregation, but also to minister to the girls who were singing. Yeah. To reach their hearts yeah. with the, the message of grace. Yeah. So what were some of the popular hymns back in that era then? 
Oh, you have to ask me that. I do. To... You knew I was going to go there, and you're like, oh, Jamie, don't do it. Don't in that direction. Um, I'll think of them. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I wish I had a book in front of me. Um, yeah, there. I don't even have my author copies yet. So. No, oh, and I understand that, and that's fine. If you can't think of any, I, I realize. <laughs> as authors, you know, amazing phrase was <laughs> around since you know way before right. then, so we right. used that one. But there are some that I think readers might go, "Oh, I've never heard that one." Before. So I, that might be kind of I remember watching Little House in the Prairie, which would have been around that era. And I remember them singing, bringing in the sheaves. I mean, this is Little House in the Prairie, so we're going to bring in the cheese as we sing it when I was a child. Now, which, yeah, <laughs> that's a whole other meaning for me today. I found cheese <laughs> on the floor before we started recording and poor Kim had to watch me clean it up. <laughs> I just remember how shocked I was when I could actually start reading, you know, and I learned to read and the things that I had been singing that I thought yes. were right. And one yes. of them was like, bringing in the cheese, bringing in the cheese. Yeah. Yep. No, I get you. I thought the Pledge of Allegiance was that we were supposed to be invisible, uh -huh. not indivisible, but invisible. Right. Mm -hmm. And I always wondered how I could pledge that to the flag <laughs> and then achieve that pledge because a pledge yeah. is a promise and somehow I have to become invisible now. And I absolutely loved the word dawns early. What word? Dawns early. Dawns. Oh, dawns Dawn, early light. Dawns early light. <laughs> yeah, I always liked that one too. That's <laughs> from, funny. From That's the, the Star Spangled Banner. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yep, yep. bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the cheese. Yep. yep. And then what was the other hymn that they always sang on Little House on the Prairie? It's bringing in the sheaves and then onward christian soldiers oh yes yes the other one yep the other one onward christian soul it's such a marching song too it is i mean yeah. you almost have to be on your feet when we you're do. singing that one yeah we do we do i wonder how it would go over at youth group if we started singing that one with all the teenagers these days <laughs> You never know till you try. We don't. We don't. I we'll have to invite the teenagers to good old fashioned hymn sing and see what they think about it in this day and age. <laughs> yeah, I still love a good hymn sing. I know. <laughs> yeah, my daughter asked me the other day. I was in the in the kitchen and I was I was humming along to some hymn that was in my mind, and she's like, "What are you humming?" And I'm like, "I'm humming a hymn, child. Go listen to it. There's a lot to learn from it." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh. I think that's one of the most fun things for me about writing historical yeah. fiction is that I get to revisit a lot of the yeah the yeah. yeah with Bertie being a singer it just lent itself so well to that yeah, yeah. that's it's really like cool my preacher's choir you know gotta have I love to that sing. I love yeah. that so it, and that you said was based off of actual history so the this reverend and his wife actually had a choir at their revival meetings that was mm -hmm. made up primarily of what I suppose they called like reformed women or something at that mm -hmm. point. Yep. Okay. All right. So all how is that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Was the reception to that historically good or? It depended on where they went. Okay. Um, you know, it, to me, it's kind of funny. Um, what I was when the reading that I did, they were better received in very small communities as oh. opposed to cities. And to me, prostitution would have been much more prevalent in the big cities. So to me, right. it seems like the smaller communities where they really didn't have to deal with that a great deal uh -huh. would be, oh, I don't want to bring those people into my church. Mm hmm. But right. They, they they tended to be he he tended to gravitate towards smaller churches because they were more receptive to yeah. these women coming in. Interesting. Uh, and it, to me, it was backwards. I would yeah. have thought it would go the other way around. Unless in the cities, maybe there was more of, of it behind closed doors, and people didn't want it to be even brought into the light, even in a good way. I don't know. Hmm. Yep. That's so interesting. It's so interesting. And history is so rich of those types of redemption stories that we don't realize um, can still be told today. Mm -hmm. so. yeah. I think one of my, um, my favorite reviews that has come in so far with this, it's, a, it's so weird to think that reviews are already in when it's not releasing for another couple months. I know. But actually compared it to Francine Rivers redeeming 
okay. in a favorable way. And that meant a lot to me yeah. because, you know, yeah. they, they saw the biblical side of things. They saw scripture being acted out. It's not what I didn't intend to right. imitate her story at all. Right. Um, right. I was just going with the research, but that really kind of touched me that they would, would see I just admire her so much. So oh, right. yeah. I even had my name in the same review with her. Right. <laughs> <laughs> was well, really special. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And she had written Redeeming Love. Gosh, that that's a couple decades old now, isn't it? Yeah. It's been a long time ago. At, at least two decades because it was out before my first book was contracted, and that's 2005. Okay. So that one was already out before then. So yeah. 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 Well, I think these stories are important to be told. I think um readers will relate to the fact that sometimes you feel like we're beyond redemption. Mm -hmm. And we're really, really not. You have never strayed no too is. far. No one ever is. No, mm -hmm. because there is no stain too dark too large that God cannot wash it clean with his grace. Mm -hmm. And all we have to do is ask for it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that's a great place to end our conversation because <laughs> it's a great note to end it on. <laughs> but if people want to um, get a hold of this novel, you, it is available for pre-order right now on Amazon. Um, and is there any other things that our readers should know about you, Kim, and, and following you? Well, follow me on Facebook. I'm not a real big social media person. Um, there are <laughs> the Twitter and the Instagram or whatever that stuff is. I can't figure it out. But I am on Facebook. <laughs> and I love communicating with people there. So they can catch up with me there. And if they want to visit my website, just KimVogelSawyer.com. Pretty easy to spell. Sounds good. Well, Kim, this is great. We'll look forward to it. The name of the book again is The Songbird of Hope Hill. It releases April 9th from Waterbrook Multnomah Press. And um, we look forward to reading it. And then, of course, having you back again in the future. That would be lovely. I would love it. <laughs>